Hey guys, this is Jacob from Living Healthy Every Day. I'm here with Thomas Ryan, the assistant professor at Trinity College Dublin, uh, leading researcher in amnesia and memory. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about engram cells and how to uh, bring back amnesia, uh, thoughts from amnesia uh, and how the storage theory is essentially wrong and what Ryan has, uh, Thomas Ryan has figured out. So, uh, Tomas, tell me a little bit about uh, how you got started in this field. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Jacob. Um, my, yes, thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, my, you. Main, uh, my main interest, I think, is really how do we store information in the brain. So I come from a background of being a geneticist, and I got into neuroscience while I was an undergraduate genetics major. And I was really fascinated with one particular feature of memory that was the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory. So short-term memory is the kind of memory that lasts maybe a few hours. Uh, long-term memory is the kind of memory that lasts your entire lifetime. And they're essentially the same thing in the, sen in the sense that they can be the same memory of the same thing of a particular person or a particular place or a particular experience. But what differentiates the short-term phase is often that it's very disruptible, whereas a long-term phase is not. So if you hit your head, you don't generally forget everything you've ever remembered, but you tend to get amnesia for things that happened recently, that happened around the time, it might be a few hours or a few days around the actual head trauma incident. This has always been known by neurologists um, and by psychologists. But what emerged in the 60s and 70s, starting with uh, Drosophila with fruit fly studies in Caltech, was that certain genes were necessary for the long-term memory, but not the short-term memory. What genes so were that, those? Do you know? Um, there, was, there was a number of different uh, ones that were originally uh, discovered. Uh, the most famous from the early studies was called CREB, which mm -hmm. is a transcription factor, which means its function is to turn on other genes. Um, now we know that there are hundreds of thousands of genes that are important for memory formation at different stages. But um, at the same time, there was, a, there was a lot of people who were not studying particular genes, as in fruit flies, but they were studying learning and memory in rodents and rats and in mice, and were using drugs to inhibit gene expression in general. And it was again found that short-term memory required, did not require new gene activity, of course gene expression is quite slow, but long-term memory does require the transcription and translation of many different genes uh, for the memory to be intact. So this fed into the consolidation idea. The consolidation is an idea that comes from psychology. and It's been around for about a hundred years. The idea being that a short-term memory is stabilized into a long-term memory. And so biologists, behavioral neuroscientists, and molecular neuroscientists spend a lot of time working on what genes are involved in this process of consolidation. And the framework has always been that this is a process of constructing a stable memory. That at the beginning, when we first learn something, we have a temporary, rather unstable memory. And that this is sort of solidified into a more concrete memory over a matter of hours to maybe days through a, an expensive process of turning on many different genes and stabilizing the engram, the engram being the material representation of a particular memory in the brain. So the reason that we were able to say anything about this, the reason that we were able to say these processes related to memory is because when you disrupted them, in flies or in mice or in rats, you got amnesia. And what that means is that you take flies or you take rodents and you train them to do a particular task. And then you either knock out the gene or you give them the drug that inhibits gene expression or some other related intervention. And then you show that you inhibited that brain process but you also cause amnesia in the animals. So amnesia is really the anchor point for which we can say we're talking about memory. It's the yeah. only way we're really able to relate biology to memory function. Um, and that is pretty much how the, 
the field has been developing for a long time and it's what got me into neuroscientists because I was absolutely fascinated by the idea that the formation of long-term memories required specific genes to be turned on and as a geneticist I thought that was really fascinating. Uh, so then I came into the field and I was a molecular neuroscientist which meant I was making mutations for particular genes in rodents and I was looking to see what the effect was on brain physiology but also on behavior. Mm -hmm. And this pro through this process I kind of became aware of a huge ambiguity that we had in the field about amnesia in general. The ambiguity is that just because an animal or a human seems to not remember a particular piece of information does not mean that the information is necessarily gone. I mean, just as in genetics, a gene can be silent. It's not expressed, but it's still there in your genome. The information yep, hasn't right. gone anywhere. Um, but the same a priori could be true of memory in any case of amnesia that you would care to mention. So a person who has traumatic brain injury or a person who has Alzheimer's disease seems to not remember something that they previously knew. Mm -hmm. but Maybe it's just a problem of access. And we haven't been able to do anything about this because it was just empirically impossible to differentiate, particularly in the rodent case, as to whether it was there or not. Yeah. But, um, but clinical models of amnesia aside, the way we study the biology of memory being based on amnesia means that we were always sort of floating in between understanding whether the biology we were studying was really about memory itself or whether it was just about the ability to retrieve a memory. Mm -hmm. So this was something that I, I became aware of I think when I was a late, late PhD student and um, I eventually moved from United Kingdom from the University of Cambridge where I was doing my PhD at the time to MIT in Boston mm -hmm. and the reason I moved to MIT was not really because of that particular question, it was more because I wanted to start to use some of the extremely enabling technology that has become available in neuroscience in the last five to ten years. Mm -hmm. One of those technologies is optogenetics. Optogenetics is absolutely changing neuroscience in every respect. It allows us to express photoactivatable opsins in whatever brain region we want. Now, the brain is an electrical organ, it's electrically active, so the way you can activate brain cells is by stimulating them, but when we stimulate them with electrodes, we're doing so in an indiscriminate manner. Optogenetics allows us to, pr to put certain opsins into particular cell types and then stimulate them with light. And these particular opsins are unusual. They are sensitive to light, like all opsins, like the opsins in our eyes, but they're also, um, can, they also conduct ions, so they will put positively charged cations from uh, the external environment of the cell into the neuron. Now that has a depolarizing effect on the cell, which results in an action potential, so the cell spikes, yeah. that's what neuronal activity is. So optogenetics allows us to have a millisecond timescale remote control for any brain region in awake behaving animals. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just optogenetics that was important. Um, what we were doing at MIT at the time was we were trying to integrate optogenetics with uh, what we call memory engram cell labeling. Now, we assume, like any neuroscientist or any materialist, that particular engrams must be stored as physical changes in the brain. Mm -hmm. And we know from the in vivo physiology field that brain regions that are involved in episodic memory and contextual memory, such as the hippocampus, show sparse activity during particular episodes. By that I mean subsets of cells are firing during a particular experience. And so the natural hypothesis was, well, those subsets of cells are somehow contributing to storing a particular memory. But no one has had a way of testing that broad idea um, with pre-existing technology. But by taking uh, a transgenic approach, where we I took immediate early genes, and immediate early genes is a technical term for genes that show activity as a function of neuronal spiking. So when a particular cell is activated, it results in turning on those genes. So we can genetically copy the promoter of those genes and make a transgenic mouse 
that only expresses the photoactivatable opsins in particular cells that are labeled by a particular experience. Mm -hmm. And using this, we were able to test back in 2011, 2012, whether this, these were actually carrying information. And the test for that is, if you activate those cells, do you get specific memory recall? Not just memory recall of random memories, but of the recall of the memory you label. So as a result? Yeah, it, the result is it works. The result okay. is that if you, train, <laughs> if you train mice to do a particular task, um, and then you activate those cells, you get the recall of that particular memory, and not other memories the mouse has. And so this took a long time for us to convince people of this. We had to use many different behavioral approaches, many different control experiments. It would take too long to describe all of them, but this was met with significant resistance by the memory field. But it was reproduced in other laboratories, and colleagues in New York and in California did the complementary experiments, which was not to activate the engram cells, but to inhibit them and show that these cells were also necessary for the recall of specific memories. So up until then, up until when this technology was made available, um, we had been lesioning whole brain regions or we had been infusing drugs into whole brain regions or deleting genes from whole brain regions. And so we were able to say that those brain regions were necessary for learning or necessary for memory, yeah. but not of specific memories. We were dealing with, you know, you, if you take out the hippocampus, the animal can't form new contextual memories at all. Yeah. Um, so it tells you the brain region is important for that area. And similarly with gene knockouts, we learned that a gene is important for a certain type of memory. Yep, correct. But, but we weren't looking at specific memories. And if we're not looking at specific memories, we're not talking about information. Mm -hmm. So the, the ability to have what we call engram technology, it was a significant uh, advance. And we've been able to apply this to a number of different questions and problems in neuroscience. One of those has been amnesia. Now, by taking it to, by using this approach to study amnesia, we, we, get, a, we get an insight, we get a double-sided insight. We get insights into the nature amnesia, of amnesia, but because we use amnesia to study memory in general, we also get insights into the nature of memory. And uh, it seemed to me, um, I think it was back in 2012, that provided we had models of amnesia that did not interfere with our ability to label engram cells, then we could test whether or not the information is still there. Because yeah. the reasoning is if the, if the amnesia is a deficit of memory access, then the information is still there in those cells somehow. Mm -hmm. And if we can basically activate those cells very strongly uh, with optogenetics, then we may be able to get the memory out, even in cases of amnesia. So this turned out to be the case. Uh, the most broad used way of inducing experimental amnesia is by giving a drug called anisomycin, which inhibits protein synthesis. And there's literally thousands of papers on creating amnesia by this pharmacological method. So we created amnesia by giving the animals an isomycin and, and causing retrograde amnesia. But when those engram cells were then activated, the memory was there and it was retrieved normally. We also showed that we could restore it to being accessible to natural cues by updating it with new information. So we created um, amnesia for a particular memory mm -hmm. and then we activated that memory, which was still present in the brain, mm -hmm. while teaching the animal new information about that particular context. And then because there was new information coincidentally happening with activating the amnesic engram, the animal then learned that new information, but also regained permanent access to that engram thereafter. So were they of, learning something new on top of that, on top right, of their own so, memory? What we did was we, we I trained wonder if that could be useful to something for like PTSD. Right. So this is this is I think the the way we need to be looking at this in in humans. So we know that learning is a very energetically expensive process. Mm -hmm. um, learning must require, um, and that learning requires the formation of enhanced synaptic, uh, of enhanced strength of synaptic connections. Now. The, 
the important thing here, I think, is to discriminate between memory from learning and recall. And I think that in the field, we had been conflating these things for a long time. So we looked at amnesia as a deficit of memory function, but by memory, we meant learning, recall, memory storage and consolidation all lumped together, but they're all very different things. So I think what distinguishes learning and recall from memory is that memory itself is, is a thing. It is a stable thing in your brain. It is a change in your brain and it can last for your entire lifetime. Learning and recall are not things, they are activities. It's a very different thing. So yeah. learning is the process of making a memory and recall is the process of getting out of memory, but it's not the memory itself. So the point is that when we looked at amnesic memory engram cells, we could see the loss of enhanced synaptic strength, which was the principal correlate of memory that people have been studying for so long and has been assumed to be the substrate of memory storage. But because it was lost in the amnesic cases and we could still get the memory back, we have a dissociation which basically shows the information survives even without the enhanced synaptic strength. So that therefore the enhanced synaptic strength is not the memory, but it's probably very important for getting at the memory. And indeed, if you look at models of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, they have in, inhibited synaptic strength, impaired dendritic spines, uh, which probably is contributing to lack of access to those memories. So there's two major questions that arise from this type of, uh, these types of findings. One is, how is the memory actually stored? Which is a really interesting scientific question. But also, it, the clinical question, which gives uh, a lot of hope for many cases of amnesia, is, well, if the memory is still there, how do we get it back? And it does seem that if we increase the synaptic potentiation or increase the dendritic spine density of these amnesic engram cells, then it may be possible to get the um, to get natural access to now, those memories Now, isn't that what nerve back. growth factors do? So nerve growth factors exactly do that. Now the problem is that you, if you were, you, if you were to give it to the brain of an amnesic animal or an amnesic human, you're going to indiscriminately affect all of the neurons there. And the crucial feature of how we're looking at engrams, as I mentioned earlier, is sparseness. That a particular contextual engram seems to occupy only about 3% of the brain cells in, a, in, the, in the hippocampus of a mouse. So if we then start pumping in nerve growth factors or whatever drug into the brain, you're going to be doing the same thing to all the cells there. So, so not specified. You, it's not really specific. It's not really specific. Mm -hmm. But what you said, what, what you said earlier about how new learning can help, I think that there is something there. I think because when you're yeah. learning something new, about something that you ha you're amnesic about. You're training your brain on those particular memory engram cells. So that's what we did in one of our original studies. So we had mice that we made amnesic for a particular context. We, we made the animal forget about a particular room. But then we taught the animal that the room was bad. But we did it, we taught an amnesic animal that the room was bad. So we activated the memory of the room, which they, were, which they had forgotten. Yeah. And then we give them a mild shock in the room so they're then afraid of it. What happens then was they learned afterwards that that room was something to be avoided just as well as the non-amnesic animals. So what that meant was that even though the memory was lost, once we activated it, we could integrate new information and that new information as a result restored access to that memory. The animal then did not need light activation of those engram cells to recall the memory thereafter. It just did it on its own. Wow. But it's important to remember that when we talk about doing these kind of things in clinical case, that there's two broad types of amnesia we need to be concerned about. Now, amnesia can be caused by a multitude of things, but some types of amnesia are chronic and some are acute. So an acute type of amnesia is something where the event is transient. It may be due to a cause that's, you know, a few days long or just in an instant. It could be drug-induced or head trauma, stress. These kind of things can be quite transient 
cause amnesia, but then the cause of the problem goes away and you're left with amnesia. Can, now, if you can get the memory back, then it's back. Okay. But then there are chronic cases of amnesia. In this case, in this instance, you're talking about things like Alzheimer's disease, things like Huntington's disease, Huntington's disease things like just normal aging, things that cause amnesia, but they're always there and they're probably getting worse in a lot of cases. So in that case, you may find that at least in the early stages of neural degeneration, the memory may still be in the brain. But say we find a way of getting it out again or doing some experiment where we induce neuronal growth in those cells, that may temporarily restore access, but very soon afterwards, the memory is going to be gone again because the cause is still there and it's still eating away at the brain. Yeah. So without dealing with the cause, you're never really going to be able to translate that into restoring memories, I think, in many cases of amnesia. Perhaps you can wrestle with it, but this is going to be a continuing problem. Um, and I think that the, in terms of really chronic cases of amnesia, the focus does have to be on addressing the cause. But it's also important to remember that once you get into very late stages of neural degeneration, when you're getting to actually having severe plaques on the brain or severe holes in the brain or severe uh, neural cell death, yeah. at that point you are probably actually going to start losing memories themselves. If you actually lose, I mean, just because a lot of cases of amnesia are likely due to memory access deficits, because memories are so stable, they have to be to last their entire life, yeah. doesn't mean that storage deficits don't exist. They certainly exist. It's, cer it's certainly true that if you get enough brain damage, you will never get those memories back, that they are in fact yeah. gone. So I think in really late stages of neurodegeneration, that's going to be a fact. Like stroke and things like that, they get like the decreased blood flow. But what they have done is they've taken uh, parts of the brain, they took it out of the brain, they put uh, stem cells, they mixed it with stem cells, and regrew those parts in the brain, and then stuck it back in the brain. And for people who didn't have stroke, or any damage to the brain, the cells just dissipated. And they, they, mm -hmm. they, uh, they added some radioactive dye that they could see, and see it in an uh, MRI. And then people with, uh, with stroke, with the lesions in their brain, uh, they could see those cells going to those lesions in the brain and actually repairing it, mm -hmm. um, which is another form of healing the brain for people who have stroke, mm -hmm. uh, something in the future. But that's only in uh, animal studies right now. Seems pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So for people who have had amnesia or people who want to uh, essentially strengthen their uh, synaptic strength, um, what can they do? What lifestyles can they do? What uh, drugs or supplements and things like that can be, what treatment approaches can be mm -hmm. taken? So, I mean, I think that's a, a multifaceted question. Um, if you're talking about preventing memory loss, preventing amnesia from happening, uh, at the moment, uh, we know that the best things that you can do is to stay mentally active and uh, engage in lots of physical exercise. Um, those two things. Um, are the major lifestyle factors in age-related memory loss. Um, yeah. There are no drugs or treatments at the moment that have a greater efficacy than those types of lifestyle uh, management techniques. Um, in terms of um, more acute cases of amnesia, where if you've suffered memory loss and can you do anything about it, memory loss is... is, is not always complete. I mean, even people who have amnesia for certain things, they often remember particular components of it. And based on understanding amnesia as an access deficit, um, I think that the best strategy is to do everything you can to strengthen those experiences, to remind yourself of them and to try and, you know, retrain, so to speak, on those particular pieces of information that are important. But this is um, a double-edged sword because what we know from the quote-unquote traumatic memory literature is that when people spend a lot of time trying to forcibly retrieve memories that they may have forgotten, I'm not talking about 
amnesia, I'm talking about just normal forgetting, yeah. um, they often introduce um, misinformation into them. Uh, in some cases, this would be considered the creation of false memories. Um, and so it's, it's a, it can be often hard to tell then whether the, whether you're actually retrieving a memory or you're forming a new memory that's similar. Um, yeah. That's it, but that's a general, general feature of memory. Um, are there any true memories is another question, but well, memory is, is an inaccurate representation of the world. That's, it's not supposed to be perfect. But. Mm -hmm. So something really interesting happened to me uh, a couple months ago. I got a concussion. I was walking off my boat and I slipped. It was raining and I, I slipped and I hit the, I have a concrete dock and I slipped and hit my head and kind of like got a little bit of amnesia. But <clears throat> apart from that, I had a whole personality change um, from being extremely extroverted uh, to more introverted. Um, but I mean, I wasn't introverted at TedMed or anything like that. Uh, just in my content, like feeling content, I feel more content introverted than I normally did uh, feeling content when I was extroverted. And I've talked to a few friends that have had a similar experiences. They got a concussion, whole personality change, thing like that. Um, <clears throat> now, would strengthening like the synaptic, uh, the the synaptic strength between my engram cells, uh, would that help bring back some of the extrovertness? Just hypothetical talk. Mm -hmm. um, I I think we're very much in the realm of, of speculation to be even addressing that. The brain does things other than memory. So when you talk about personality changes, which is a general feature of people who have experienced concussion, yeah. um, there's no reason to think that's linked with memory. It's, it's, there's no um, framework where we think about personality as being a memory of the self. So, I mean, the simplest way of interpreting what you're talking about is that it's a type of, it's an effect of mild brain damage that is probably in parallel or independent of whatever effect there is on memory. I, I don't think um, personality is, is, is something that is really learned. I mean, it, it, you could argue that it's something that we do develop and our education affects our personality. But a lot of what our personality is, is genetically determined and part of a lot of our brain structure is quite genetically determined and if you change your brain structure by incidental trauma you're going to change some of your personality um, it doesn't have to be something that is related to memory or amnesia but that said I mean I don't think it could be one could categorically rule out that it's due to a memory problem but I think we're, we're really beyond what we know about the brain when talking about that mm -hmm. Just trying to think of other ways that we can possibly uh, change our body, and uh, I've been looking to research. We were talking about PTSD a little bit before, uh, when you're able to um, uh, turn on certain cell, uh, turn on certain genes. Um, have you looked into uh, histone deacylase inhibitors? Uh, mm -hmm. They've been using it for cancer, but there's also new research using it into PTSD. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Not personally, but other labs in the world have been looking at the effect of drugs that modulate histone acetylation uh, on memory function, uh, such as Liwei Sai's lab at MIT and others around the world have been looking at that. There definitely seems to be uh, something, something there. It's not particularly surprising. Uh, gene expression being important for memory formation or memory consolidation, the formation of access to memory. Uh, histone acetylation uh, being ubiquitously involved in regulation of gene expression throughout the genome. Yeah, of course. Um, it's it's completely logical that modifications of histones would therefore affect uh, synaptic plasticity, memory access, and so on. And so, yeah. it certainly is a prom like uh, like nerve growth factors. It, it is a promising mechanism for for for. Um, for growing new connections or yeah. for managing for managing brain deficits. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it really much that you, you came on and uh, talked about all this. Uh, thank you. 
Thanks for having me, Jacob. Thank you. So that was Thomas Ryan. Uh, you can see more. Uh, I'll, I'll link uh, some of the information that I was talking about and the studies in the description below so you can check it out. Thanks, guys, for watching, and stay beautiful.